We all love a flower when it opens in a glorious explosion of spirit. But have you ever wondered what forces shatter that tight bud to reveal the flower? I experienced many of those shatterings in my life. My father died just before I turned 20 and got married. That husband nearly killed me pounding my head on the floor. My mother committed suicide seven years later. My brother got lost in drugs and eventually killed himself too. By the time I was 27, I was so suicidal I knew I had to find a completely different way to live than my family had taught me. I did not yet know that on this journey of exploration, I would discover a hidden wellspring of joy. I would become one of the top six precision wax carving specialists in jewelry in North America. That my paintings would win awards in international competitions. Or that I would write books published in six languages. Over the years, as these events unfolded in my life, I learned how creative consciousness makes the difference between vibrant life or decay and death. When I train others to apply the creative process to their own work and goals, I emphasize the three main components, inspiration, mastery, and transformation. For the beginning artist, just being in the mood to create is an unexpected gift. Inspiration comes and goes of its own accord, just out of control and random. The professional artist has to learn to deliberately invoke the muse, to move into a creative state at will. Now, nothing really tames the wildness of the creative process, but we can learn to work with it on a regular basis. The first step is actively engaged interest. My husband, Byrne, gives a great example of how our interests shape the way inspirations appear to us. I was driving our van to a jewelry show, and he was in the passenger seat. He took his shoes off and put one foot up on the dash, saw the reflection of his sock in the windshield. He designed a $1,500 gold pendant from the shapes he saw in the glass. Now, most of us do not see jewelry designs in our socks. <laughs> most jewelers don't, really. But Byrne caught that vision. And this is something that can be practiced. We can all learn to be more alert and to notice more deeply. And when my little red-headed daughter, Aloria, was two years old, she watched me throwing miniature clay pots on the potter's wheel. I would take a ball of clay, center it on the wheel, shape it into a cone, pull up a little pot, cut it off, set it aside, pull up another little pot, and so forth. I could throw as many as 50 pots from one ball of clay. Apparently, to her two-year-old eyes, she thought Mommy took hold of the clay and magical little pots appeared. Eagerly, she picked up a piece of clay and squeezed. To her horror, all it did was go squish in her hands. That is the moment we first recognize the need for mastery, when our dreams just go squish in our hands. Inspiration comes with an excited quickening of energy. But mastery requires a concentrated focus and steady practice. The lead singer of the musical group Debu knows how to play over a hundred different folk instruments from all over the world. He once said, learning to play that first instrument was really hard. But then all the rest were easy. 
The popular concept is that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to master something, like that first instrument. Just what does this dedication accomplish? Mastery is what prevents us from wasting our inspirations. With mastery, we can embody an inspiration in a form others can recognize. Now this sounds like the creative process is complete. Most artists would think so, but that's not true. The third component of creative consciousness, transformation, is the one most easily overlooked and misunderstood. When we change forms externally, we also change internally. We can learn to know our own spirit through our creations. Casting jewelry is a particularly dramatic transformation. I take my torch, I light it, and I aim it into the crucible to melt the gold. The gold's in small pellets and maybe an old sprue button. They hold their shape for a while until they glow red hot and slump into a puddle. Once that puddle moves like quicksilver, I let the centrifuge slam it into the cavity I prepared. I made this cavity by burning away a wax that I spent hours, days, maybe even weeks carving. And this is the story of my life and of your lives. Old forms being destroyed as new ones are created. As I receive each transformation, it shows me unknown aspects of myself. Over time, these gradually accumulate into enormous changes in how I see myself and what I want to create. Painting works the same way. The first thing I do when I begin a new painting is destroy the pristine whiteness of a brand new canvas. Those first brush strokes aren't a finished painting yet. Frankly, they are a real mess. But if I stay with the process, if on one hand I take my inspiration, and on the other my understanding of the materials and techniques, and combine them, something extraordinary may happen. I once painted a poppy five feet wide named Angel Shadow. A good client bought it for her dying cousin. Later, she came back to me. Lexi, Lexi, remember Angel Shadow and my cousin? She didn't die after all. She started to get better, and the doctors don't know why. But I know it had a lot to do with your painting. I was surprised. But then, if the creative process makes the difference for me between living and dying, why wouldn't someone else find that in my painting? Unfortunately, this life-giving process is largely absent from our collective energies of creation. When we short-circuit the creative process, ideas just run wildly amok. Without this awareness of transformation, we, as humanity, lose touch with what we create. As a result, we build a nuclear power plant that inadvertently poisons the ocean. We develop agricultural technology that destroys the fertility of the soil. We knowingly build homes on earthquake faults and floodplains. We murder each other in appalling ways. The breakdown of creative transformation is lethal indeed. If humanity in all its groups practiced healthy creativity, including transformation, our group creations would change drastically. The best place to begin is within our own communities. And failure teaches us pretty quickly. 
We have all experienced breakdowns in the creative process in our communities, whether these are small towns, church groups, professional groups, any groups whatsoever we belong to. Can you remember someone in one of your groups who had a useful idea with good intentions and then tried to execute this in some totally haywire manner? In my town, someone wanted a new library building and tried to go about it with a really unpopular tax. Now that fractured the community. Problems like this arise from breakdowns in inspiration and mastery. By not including the library project or the other good ideas in a broader vision for the community, no direction is set for the healthiest overall solution. Instead, the handiest solution is usually chosen with little thought to other consequences, at least until the uproar starts. Unfortunately, not everybody has good intentions. That's another function of mastery, to be able to understand the situation deeply enough that we can discern when one thing is being said, but something else is already underway. All the breakdowns of inspiration and mastery typically lead to breakdowns in transformation as well. Misguided efforts just can unexpectedly destroy what the community has already created. So if we want our community to thrive instead of shatter or decay, we must include all the members in a broad vision, a shared inspiration that inspires the whole community to directed, focused action. For example, a community that has a dream of providing employment for upcoming generations so they don't have to move elsewhere gives a totally different direction for action than the dream of a retirement community that has recreation and services for seniors. The action has to be grounded in mastery because mastery brings the clarity of the mind into the inspired vision of the heart then transformation shows us what we have created and how it matches our shared inspiration or if more work is needed. When I train groups in the creative process, the first thing I do is teach each individual how to use inspiration, mastery, and transformation. Now, if you are someone who doubts your own creativity, let me invite you to get up in the morning, put a huge scowl on your face, and stomp through the day, snarling and snapping at everyone around you. I guarantee you'll see what you create. The real question is not if you are creative, but what and how you already are creating. This is true both for individuals and for groups. When all the individuals in a group understand inspiration, mastery, and transformation, the door opens for powerful group creativity. We do not have to shatter our community to build a better place. We do not have to grow our community by accident. We don't have to let our community decay and die like Detroit. Collaborative group creations, and what is community but a collaborative group creation, do pose larger challenges than individual creations. The first challenge is arriving at a shared inspiration. Our practical nuts and bolts people, who we really need, may prematurely head off into the how to do it questions of mastery. But it is a pointless waste of time to debate which tire is the best 
when we don't yet know if we're building a tractor or a race car. Another challenge is resistance to change. However, as our world transforms, so must we. Perhaps some of you recall the 1950s when it was common for a family to freeze 300 trout for the winter. There are far too many people fishing today for that to work, so we catch and release, resulting in a whole new tourism industry. Once again, as old forms are destroyed, new ones are created. By now, it should be clear that this process never ends. Inspiration, mastery, and transformation just continue to dance with each other in an ongoing creative expansion. For that reason, I invite each one of you to fully embrace your own creativity. I ask you to open to your own inspirations, to really notice them. I ask you to practice the kinds of mastery that you need to create your inspirations so they don't just go squish. And I ask you to recognize your own transformation as you do this. I also ask you to creatively collaborate with others in your community. This will let your spirit blossom like a poppy in dawn light, bringing greater vitality to your life, to the lives of those around you, transforming your community. There is no greater gift we can share with one another. Thank you.